and welcome back to Dash School, Padawan. I am your teacher, Amanda B. Johnson, and as a quick recap, what we've discussed thus far is... In our hypothetical digital ledger of e-money, or, hey, our blockchain, the who gets to make updates to it are the miners. You know, those people with the funny, fancy, math-problem-solving computers. A miner gets to make an update to the ledger when their machine was the first one to have solved the math problem, this being done in a regular and orderly manner. And the reason why we are able to trust these entries into the ledger as being accurate is that the entire history of every unit of e-money is public in the blockchain. Just as an example, imagine that this is a zoomed-in snapshot of two consecutive blocks. If this block shows me having more units of e-money than I did in the last block, there has to be a transaction, a record of someone sending me that e-money for this block to be valid. If there isn't, not a valid block. Same would go for your balance. If this block shows you as having zero, and in the last block you had 2.5 units of e-money, again, there must somewhere within this block be a record of a transaction of you sending your 2.5 units of e-money somewhere else. If that didn't actually happen, invalid. And so then you may be wondering, how do people send units of e-money to one another to then be recorded in these blocks in the blockchain? And that takes us to what I told you today's lesson would be about. Cryptography is a form of mathematics that provides the basis for how different accounts on the blockchain interact with one another. And you don't need to understand cryptography, trust me, I don't, to understand how we use it. Remember how I mentioned in the last lesson that on a blockchain, our accounts aren't organized by something like our name, but are rather tracked by cryptographic alphanumeric addresses that look something like this. Psst, the word alphanumeric being a combination of alphabetic letters and numbers. There you go. So if you wanted to, say, pay me some units of e-money to pay me back for taking you out to lunch, I would send you this alphanumeric address, and that would be the address you would send the units of e-money to from your wallet. So our blockchain would show something like your address, unique from mine, having sent three units of e-money to my address. And the next block would be published to reflect this transaction. So that leaves us with the question, well, how did you make that transaction? Did you give a phone call to one of the miners and read them off your long alphanumeric address and read them off mine and say, hey, make the update? No. What you did was you broadcasted a message signed by your private key. <laughs> Rewind. Your address, you know, the one where you receive payments and can then send on payments to others? There's another word for it. It can also be referred to as your public address. And guess what? The only way to move funds out of this address, that is the only way to spend from it, is to know the private key. And private keys are really long and look something like that. And they're stored right within your wallet, so it's not like you have to memorize them or something. And so that's how payments on the e-money ledger work. You receive funds to your public address, and you can only spend them. That is, you can only move them on the ledger if your wallet software contains the private key. That makes private keys super top secret, because anybody who knows the private key for a public address can spend from it. That's why nobody goes around posting their private keys in online forums. It's just not done. So when using your hypothetical e-money wallet and you want to send Amanda three e-monies for covering lunch yesterday, all you as the user do is tell your wallet you want to send three e-money and click send. Easy enough. What your wallet is really doing, however, 
is creating a signature of your private key that only you know that broadcasts the amount you want to send and to whom to the entire rest of the network so that they can update their ledgers accordingly. So that whole public address, private key thing, the stuff that's mostly managed by your wallet, that's the cryptography bit. See, I told you it wasn't that hard. And as a little bonus bit of knowledge for you, remember how mining is solving math problems? The math that those mining machines are doing are called hash functions, and they are based on cryptography. Cool, huh? So. I have to say right now, congratulations to you, because thus far, you already know everything you need to know about a blockchain. First, that it's a digital ledger. Second, that updates to it are mined. And third, is that the account system, you know, the sending and receiving bit, as well as the mining system, is all based on a form of math called cryptography. You win! You win the golden ticket for getting this far. So that just leaves one question in my mind, really. If this blockchain system I've just described to you makes for such a cool e-money and all, why aren't your neighbors using a blockchain-based form of money? Why doesn't the butcher down the street accept some kind of e-money? How is it that this whole money-by-blockchain phenomena has not spread across the face of the Earth? Well, at Dash digital cash, that's because we believe that it's got to be way more functional than that. So, what makes Dash different? Why do we believe that Dash will become the e money that your neighbors and neighborhood butcher and, yes, even mother come to use? Simply tune into the next episode of Dash School to find the answer. If we're going to be providing service to our customers, we've got to have a way that we can change what it is we do to meet their ever-changing demands in the marketplace. We have to function as a DAO, a decentralized, autonomous organization.